Um, how many of you guys in the audience have uh, asked yourself this question that's up behind me? Just raise your hands. Wow. That's quite a lot. Uh, I asked myself this question back in 1994. Uh, I was 30 years old. I was living in London. I'd spent two years working with a company called the Added Value Company. It was Europe's first marketing agency. I was uh, working 80 hour weeks. That's roughly about 13 hours a day, six days a week. Um, I used to wake up in the morning, six o'clock, get to work by eight, finish by 10 at night, get home, hang out with my girlfriend, crash out at about one or two, and up again at six, and start all over again. Uh, I was definitely, as we call it, in the rat race, but I was driving a Porsche 911, company policy. We won't pay you anything, but you can drive any car you want. <laughs> so there was I, enjoying myself. And this question is to pop into my mind. Uh, how much money do you need to have to stop working? And my first initial analysis was pretty straightforward and quite simple and elegant. Uh, it sort of said that uh, in life, life can be explained with two dimensions, two independent variables, the amount of free time you have and the amount of money that you make. I knew a lot of people who were in the lower left-hand quadrant. No money, no time. There's a whole bunch of us. Okay. I certainly had friends who had lots of money but no time. We know those guys too. And then there were my other friends. Young people, students, or pairs, bartenders, were on minimum wage. And they had lots of time but absolutely no money. But there was just a handful of people who were actually in the top right quadrant. Uh, who had lots of money and lots of time. And I sort of felt that this unequal distribution of people sort of implied or concluded that there was actually an invisible barrier that stopped most everyday people from getting into the top right-hand quadrant. So I went around asking my friends and buddies, um, how do you go from no time, no money, to lots of time and lots of money? And all of them sort of pre-consistently said, no, work smart, get promoted, uh, become a director, uh, get stock options, sell out, make your millions, retire by 40. So that was pretty straightforward and pretty consistent advice that I got from a whole bunch of people. So 2005 was a crazy year. I sort of doubled my workload, doubled my clients, doubled my internal projects, uh, I started working some days, and I was sort of working 120 to 130 hours a week. That's roughly, roughly 18 hours a day, seven days a week. My sex life, zero. Okay, I used to get home after my girlfriend would be asleep, and I'd have to leave before she'd wake up. So I knew I was sacrificing my personal life for a promotion. And sure enough, six months later, I was promoted. Project manager, 30,000 pounds a year. Okay, and most people around me thought of me as quite a superstar. So now, I was a rat who was actually a superstar rat with Hot Wheels. Um, <clears throat> everything was going fine until one morning when I woke up. And I looked at my clock on the side of my bed and it said 302. Never forget that. Two minutes past three o'clock in the morning. And the first thought that came into my head was, shit, I'm late for work. And I remember looking at myself in the mirror across my bed, and the room was dark, and I could see the silhouette of a person, and all their hair was standing up, like they'd gotten a serious amount of electric shocks. And I knew there was something wrong with this picture. That morning when I drove to work, the streets were still empty, they were still dark, it was cold and wet in London, and I realized that there was a significant fundamental problem with my strategy to go into the top right-hand quadrant. So I went back to the drawing board, I looked at my hypothesis, I modified it a bit, I put some numbers in, and this is what I came up with. A minimum salary of 100,000 pounds is what I would call good. And my free time, I sort of gave it a slightly simple scale, saying if you have just the Sundays free, you've got 50 days free in a year. If you take the week off, weekend off, 
you get 100 days a year, which is about three months of free time. And I had friends of mine in Europe whose parents at that time were working six months in Europe and then spending six months in some beautiful sunny country. So working six months on, six months off was definitely happening. So we had six months. And then nine and 12 months were just logical extensions. Uh, this paradigm also sort of made me show, made me see that I was swimming in the wrong direction. I was sort of moving to no free time and no money, uh, despite getting promoted and despite having a higher salary. So um, the question was, you know, what went wrong? And how was I going to fix it? Um, I then looked at what people were saying to me. What people were saying to me was, make the money first, the free time will follow. You know, in other words, the money is the cause and the effect is free time. Now, I knew from personal experience that this relationship wasn't working for me, this causal relationship. So I looked at this and I said, well, suppose this is wrong. Suppose everybody's got it wrong. And suppose the causal relationship is reversed, which really you can have the free time, the money will follow. And this gave me my new hypothesis, which really said, if you can increase, if I could increase my free time, my income would grow. With this new hypothesis, I immediately, of course, started looking for a new job that was going to pay me more money and give me more free time. By January of 1996, I was hired by YNR, it's the third, world's third largest agency. And uh, I was briefed to develop a, uh, a brand consultancy for them out of Amsterdam. Amsterdam, my favorite city. Okay. They were gonna relocate me to Amsterdam. They were gonna give me 80,000 pounds a year. They were gonna pay for my house, my car, my petrol, my bar bills, my restaurant expenses. And they were gonna fly me every weekend to London so I could hang out with my wife. Okay, so I got back to the chart, I looked at it and I said, okay, I started from down there. Today, I've got more free time and I'm making more money. So I was headed at least in the right direction. A year later, 1997, I got offered another job. Uh, it was from Weinar, the group across Europe, and they wanted to give me the job of being the regional director for strategic planning for Citibank across 36 countries between England and India. That is my region. Now, I knew if I kept either job, my free time wasn't going to suffer. I was still going to have my weekends free. But me, you know, I thought, what happens if I do both jobs simultaneously? Will my free time increase? Will my income increase? So for the next two years, I kept two jobs. And I was so good at both of them that I became known as an internationally famous rat who could get the job done. My, my salary touched over 100,000 pounds a year. My bonus was another 20 grand. And my free time went up. Because not only did I have my weekends free, but I was actually spending a lot of time in duty-free shopping, business class lounges, and in some of the best hotels between Chennai and London. Things were looking good. The paradigm was working. I had more time and more money now than ever before. 1999, let me come back. 1999, my uh, wife got pregnant. And at that time, I decided uh, to um, give up my six-figure salary, give up my two jobs, and become a full-time dad and a part-time consultant. I knew my free time was going to go up. The question was, what was going to happen with the money? Uh, I found as a freelance consultant in Europe, I could charge 30 to 40,000 pounds per project. Each project would take me about a month to complete. I'd work for three or four projects in a year. That would give me about 120 grand income. That was about the same that I was getting at YNR. But now, I was only working three to four months a year. The other eight months, me and my son 
were in Starbucks, parks, museums, art galleries, uh, play groups, and any restaurant or pub that was kid friendly. It was looking great. Then in 2001, there was this uh, very close friend of mine who came to me and he said, Rahul, you know, we need to start a new consultancy. And I said, listen, David, I'm retired, I'm done. Been there, I've done it, I'm not interested. And he looked at me and said, no, 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 this is not a run-of-the-mill consultancy, Rahul. We're gonna specialize in three industry sectors. Adult entertainment, wow. Gambling, okay, and biotechnology. <laughs> cloning, human cloning, companies that are involved with that. And clearly, obviously, you know, that was the end of my retirement. And that was the birth of Oedipus. When people asked us what we did, we would say to them, you know, you come to us looking like that lizard. Oops. Where's it got? Oedipus. You come to us looking like that lizard above because of the industry or the business you represent. For 50 grand, we guys can transform your business's image to make you looking like Brad Pitt. Somebody that everybody likes and wants to be friends with. So our clients included the Rank Group, it's the world's largest casino company. We had worldpunt.com, it was an online gambling startup. We had Spearmint Rhino, who was the world's largest lap dancing club. We had uh, Erotica, the largest consumer uh, fair. We had Torture Garden, uh, England's largest fetish club. And of course, we had Playboy, who was trying to launch sex toys into Europe. Those were our clients. We had a lot of hard work. The work was challenging. <laughs> But, guess what happened? My free time was now limited to weekends. And over the two years, David and I probably took home 50 grand apiece after taxes and expenses. Um, free time went down, money went down. The next year, 2003, my father passed away in India, and I inherited his share of India's largest marketing consultancy, Quadra Advisory. It had 21 consultants, two offices, Bombay and Delhi, turnover about three crore rupees. So whilst me and my mom were dealing with my dad's death, the other shareholders and directors got together and virtually emotionally blackmailed me and asked me to look after the business. That's what good Indian sons did. You can guess what happened. My free time was back down to me only Sundays, because in India, it's quite the norm to work on Saturdays. And now my salary was in Indian rupees. Ladies and gentlemen, it took me 10 years and I'd gone full circle. And I was back to where I'd started, 10 years later. It took me two months, two years, sorry, two years to sell Quadra. Sir Martin Sorrell and his WPP group. And uh, whilst the shareholders were happy to divide the winnings, I managed to regain my free time. Okay. And it was at that time I thought to myself, uh, I should not now get into starting a new venture that actually depended on my expertise as an international brand consultant to succeed. Instead, the way I was going to make money was by investing in the st Indian stock market, where I had absolutely no expertise. And in some strange way, I felt that by disconnecting my income from my expertise, I was actually gonna protect my free time. It lost over the last four years. So I hired a bunch of guys out of Bombay, investment bankers, and I said, here's the money, invest it in the stock market, make sure my mother and I can now live off the returns. And they looked at me, and the first thing they said is, well, Rahul, how much Money do you and your mother want every year? And this same old question came back to haunt me again. This is a question that I'd just never been able to answer. How often I tried, I was always giving up 
before I could get there. And then my mother said, well, maybe, Rahul, the reason is you're asking the wrong question. Maybe the right question is, how little do you need to live your dream? And the penny dropped. Now, my mother was absolutely right again. It was a wrong question because that question had no answer. So with a new question and Excel spreadsheets and bank statements and credit card bills, I set about trying to identify all the expenses that we were going to incur, fixed and variable. And once I had those expenses down, I looked at what was the least amount of money we needed to spend to maintain our existing lifestyle. And 24 hours later, the number was clear. Three lakhs a month each. And this is after taxes. And my mother and I could retain our own independent lifestyles. We could travel to Europe once a year. And I could take a road trip every month. I mean, after working for 16 years in Europe, the one thing I wanted to do with my free time was to explore India by road. So I had to be able to afford it. And this was the number. So I briefed the investment guys. I said, listen, you need to generate six lakhs a month for me and my mom. It was very interesting. For the next seven years, this is what happened to my mother's net worth. It went from 1.5 crores to 10 crores. And this is despite two recessions, 2008 and 2010. By 2011, my mother was absolutely a, a dollar pound millionaire. And uh, it was at that time that I decided that me and my wife and my dog and my cook were going to move to Goa. And so we shifted to Agonda. And these guys on the beach look at me and they say, wow, dude, you really do live the dream. And I look at them and I say, yep, yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's been my journey from the rat race to paradise. Thank you. For